This is going to be verse by verse of 1 Corinthians 11. And Paul talks about a lot of things in this chapter. But in verse 1 he says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So Paul follows Christ, making it fine for you to follow Paul. In 1 Peter 2.21 it says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. So you can follow Paul because he follows the Lord Jesus Christ and we're supposed to follow the Lord Jesus Christ's steps. In Ephesians 5.1, Paul says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. So everybody follows somebody. The person to follow is the one who points you in the direction of Jesus Christ, the King James Bible, holy living, and just things that the Bible represents. But Exodus 23.2 says, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Christians are doing this today. Christians have the follow button hit on every wicked singer, dancer, model, actor, and athlete, but they're not following God. 3 John verse 11 says, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. So don't follow that which is evil. Now verse 2, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. So what are these ordinances that Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 11 too? Specifically here, Paul talks about the Lord's Supper in this chapter. That's one of them. And another ordinance for a Bible believer is water baptism. These things have absolutely nothing to do with getting saved or staying saved. He says in verse 3, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So every born-again man on this earth is under God. Jesus Christ is the head. Colossians 1.18 And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So if Jesus is the head, then he needs to be the reason for everything that you're doing. If he is the head, then he needs to be the one who gets the glory. In 3 John verse 9, it says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence, preeminence among them, receiveth us not. It seems many people do the work of the Lord for self so that they can have the preeminence. They want to be recognized as a great man of God or scholar. They want to be like the Michael Jordan of the Bible believing world so they can constantly try to outdo everyone else around them. But most times if you are trying to outdo the ones around you, then you are trying to get the glory. Instead of you working with everyone else to get the goal, to get glory, you need to work to get glory to the head, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the head. He's the one that deserves the preeminent place. He's the one who sh people should be worried about following, not just following you when you go down the wrong road. Verse 3 says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So the head of the woman is the man. The head of the man isn't the woman. It's Jesus Christ. And you know when society is going downhill when you see woman worship. That is what you have today with the woman in charge of the man. Isaiah 3.12 says, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. Now, Christ is God. It says in 1 Corinthians 11.3, And the head of Christ is God. But he humbled himself, you see, and took on the form of a servant. Jesus Christ prayed to God. He did the will of the Father. As it says in John six thirty eight through 39 For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. That's what Jesus said. He said, I came not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. The head of Christ is God, but Christ is God. It's something that we can't fully grasp our minds around because we aren't God. But Jesus Christ is God, yet he came not to do his own will, but the will of him that sent me, the will of him that sent him. So this is something that uh, the more you try to explain it, the harder it will become. But 1 Corinthians eleven four says, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, 
dishonoreth his head. Now, when you read the rest of the chapter, and when we go through the rest of the chapter, then you're going to see, by looking at verse 15, that the covering on the head is the person's hair and not a hat. But every man praying or prophesying with his head cover dishonoreth his head. Then if you look at verse 14, it says, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? So a man's head is covered when he has long hair. This isn't about wearing a hat. Nature shows you that when a man has long hair, it is a shame unto him. So similar, similar to how when a woman has short hair, it many times is a sign of rebellion. Now verse 5 and 6, But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. So a man should have short hair. And a woman should have long hair if they can help it. Now, I mean, I know there's situations where you can't help it. But you'll notice that a lot of lesbian women will cut their hair off to look more masculine. And many women involved in the, the I guess, women's lib will cut off their hair. It's a sign of rebellion. It's a sign that they don't want to go the way that God wants them to. Uh, just like it is for a man to have long hair. It's a common thing for girls to like men with long hair because they like someone, deep down, they like someone that looks rebellious. And a lot of the rock stars will grow their hair out long and put on mascara and paint their fingernails. Uh, nature itself shows you something is wrong with this. And I always thought it was sissy looking when a man was taking a hair band and putting his hair up in a bun. But the, the little man buns are against nature. But that that is the year 2020. The men want to be like women and the women want to be like men. The woman wants to rule the house. The man wants to stay at home and be lazy and just lay around on the couch. Only they don't want to get out there on the, in the workplace and work with their own hands. They want to stay at home and the women don't want to stay at home and be a keeper at home. They want to be an a, a independent career woman while the men want to stay at home and play modern warfare on the Xbox. You see, I'm not just against women, the things women are doing today. Men are also doing horrible things. You see, the Bible is not just against women, and it's not just against men. It's against man in general. Man is a sinner, and most men don't act right, most women don't act right. There's no sex sexism involved here. Verse 7 says, For if a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. So remember, the covering is about a person's hair. It's not about head wear. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. So as Paul says here, a man indeed ought not to cover his head. And by looking at the other verses, it seems to say his head is covered when he has long hair. The man is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. As I said, a society is going downhill when you bring in woman worship. When women are worshipped, then people are serving the creature more than the creator. When women are worshipped, God isn't getting the glory. Man is getting the glory because the woman is the glory of the man. You see, women worship all over the place. Everywhere you go, you see it. In the songs, you see it. Ariana Grande has the song, God is a Woman. Billy Ellis refers to God as a woman. Florida Georgia Line has a song called Holy, where they give a woman godlike characteristics. What about the pornography industry? Men make idols out of the porn stars. They worship the body of women. So you see a lot of this woman having the, women having the preeminent place even over God today. Verse 8 says, For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. So Eve came from Adam. Adam didn't come from Eve. As you see in Genesis 2, 21 through 23. And it says in verse 9, Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. And Genesis 2, 18, it says, And Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. So the woman is the help meet, not the man. 
1 Corinthians 11.10, For this calls out the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. The idea is if the woman doesn't have long hair, it shows the spirit world that she is a rebel. Just like when the man has long hair, it shows the spirit world that he's a rebel. Pretty much what you get from these verses is if, if possible, a woman should keep long hair, if possible, and if possible, a man should keep short hair. Now, I'm not one of these people that goes around and thinks just somebody's just full of the devil if they got short hair or if they got long hair. I'm really just going over it because it came up verse by verse in this chapter. But here in 1 Corinthians 11:11 11, 11, it says, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. So notice it says, In the Lord. In the Lord ye are neither male nor female. As it says in Gal Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's true. But physically, you still are whatever God made you. If you're a man, you're still a man. Physically, I hope. If you're a woman, you're still a woman. Physically. Now verse 12. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. So as the woman is of the man... Because she came out of Adam, even so is the man also by the woman. Because every man after Adam got here by a woman, his mother. Uh, verse 13, judging yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? So, is it good and suitable that a woman pray without a head covering? Which is not a bonnet, it's long hair. Verse 14, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? So there are probably a lot of good Christian men with long hair. But the Lord says it's a shame for him to have long hair. Each and every one of us has something that we need to fix or get right or improve. I notice that a lot of men with long hair get very, very upset about these verses. But this is something you need to improve. Cut your hair. It plainly says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Uh, verse 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. So see here is the verse that gives you the answer for a good portion of this chapter. When it talks about a head covering, it's talking about hair on your head, not a hat. The woman should have long hair, the the man should have short hair. You hear a lot of preaching against man with long hair, but you don't hear a lot of preaching about women with short hair. Women, if they can help it, should have long hair. Verse 16 and 17, But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. Verse 18, For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. So the problem was that there were heresies in their church. People were dividing because they couldn't get their doctrine right. And he mentioned in 1 Corinthians 1 how they were divided over who they followed. They, One of them was for Apollos, one was for Paul, one was for somebody else, one was for this person, one was for that person. So they were dividing over everything. And verse 19 says, For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So when a false teacher gets up and has a lot of bad doctrine, this shows you who the ones are that are approved. It shows you who has the good doctrine. The best way to see truth is to put it side by side with error. The truth will be consistent, and the one in error will not be consistent. The good thing about having a false teacher around is that it will cause the good teachers to study harder and to protect the sheep from the false teacher. It keeps you on your toes. But most Christians today don't study the Bible enough to know a heresy when they see a heresy. But here in chapter 11, there seems to be heresies going on with the Corinthians concerning the ordinance, the Lord's Supper. It says in verse 20, But when ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. The Corinthians were coming together not to eat the Lord's Supper. They were having a meal. Some people were bringing their own food, and some people didn't have any food. It says in 21 and 22, For in eating, every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. 
What, have you not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise you the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. So while Paul complimented them back in verse 2, he's not complimenting them on this. And now we'll proceed to tell them the proper way in taking the Lord's Supper. In verse 23 and 24, it says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. So first we see that the Lord's Supper is a memorial and not a sacrifice. When you take the Lord's Supper, you are reminded of how the Lord died on the cross and shed his blood. In verse 25, it says, After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Also notice the phrase, as oft as ye drink it. It is left up to us how often we partake of the Lord's Supper. There is no set rule on how often that we get you have to do it. It says in 20, verse 26, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. But when you do it, you show the Lord's death till he come. To me, this seems to be one of the greatest proofs that we should still have this ordinance if we are to do it till he comes. Now, verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So if you partake of the Lord's Supper, you can take it unworthily. That's why first you need to examine yourselves, as it says in verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So before you take of the Lord's Supper, you need to examine yourself. Is there anything between you and the Lord concerning your fellowship? Do you have unconfessed sin? And if you do, then just confess your sin, and he's going to be faithful and just to forgive you your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Make sure that you have confessed any besetting sin that you have going on, and also have your mind set to forsake that sin. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine, it says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So this verse shows another way to, to drink and eat unworthily is to do it not discerning the Lord's body. So how do you not discern the Lord's body? The Lord in his physical is in his physical glorified body in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God. He isn't dying on the cross over and over and over and over again, as some may teach. Now, the Lord's spiritual body is made up of every born-again believer. When you partake of the Lord's Supper, the bread does not actually become his body. You aren't literally eating and drinking his flesh and blood. And if you don't understand these simple truths about the Lord's body, then you drink damnation to yourself. You're doing it unworthily, and this damnation has nothing to do with going to hell if you're saved. It has to do with the next verse, which is, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. The damnation has to do with people being weak, sickly, and even death, which is sleep. Sometimes in the Bible when it says sleep, it means someone is dead. So make sure that you discern the Lord's body and confess your sins because in verse 31 it says, If we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. If you will judge yourself, examining yourself, confessing and forsaking your sins, then you're going to make things a lot easier on yourself. When it comes to salvation and eternity, our sins are paid for and forgiven and won't send us to hell. However, your sins have consequences in the flesh. They can make you sick. And Paul said, He that liveth for the flesh shall die. The Lord will chasten a Christian who sins. Hebrews 12, 8 says, But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Now verse 32 in 1 Corinthians 11. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. So when you take the Lord's Supper, wait for everyone to be served the bread, then eat. Tarry one for another. That's why we do this. Verse 34, And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together into condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. If any man is hungry and just wanting a meal, then he should eat at home, because in the Lord's Supper there obviously won't be enough served to satisfy hunger. But that is why Paul said before, way back in verse 22, Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? So don't be coming to the Lord's Supper thinking you're going to be served a big meal. That's not what it's about anyway. But this has just been a few things out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And hopefully you'll get to study it as well on your own time. And maybe this will help whet your appetite for this chapter.